Sports Illustrated just opened a new store right in your own living room with a large selection of the newest, hottest, and most unique sports merchandise and entertainment releases. At the Sports Illustrated store, you can get the best sports videos like Michael Jordan Airtime. Plus, quick access to championship tapes featuring the Super Bowl, the NBA Finals, the Final Four, and the World Series. There's also high-quality, authentic sports merchandise. The real stuff from NFL Pro Line, NBA Authentics, and Major League Baseball's Authentic Diamond Collection. Our sports collectibles feature the original 1954 first issue of Sports Illustrated as well as signed SI covers from some of the biggest names in sports. Plus, there's also the latest SI book releases. It's sport shopping the easy way. Just look for our product inserts or our Sports Illustrated store ads in the pages of SI. To order, call toll-free 1-800-274-5200. number one name in sports and the number one name in home entertainment comes the game event for all seasons football meets baseball two great games in one sports illustrated meets super nintendo you call the play you throw the pitch catch a touchdown pass or hit a game-winning home run America's two favorite pastimes on one game cartridge. Sports Illustrated Championship Football and Baseball. From Malibu Games, also available on Game Boy. We created a whole new automotive category. Brought the American Roadster back up to speed. And reshaped the four-door sedan. You could say we've changed all the rules. Makes you wonder what we'll think of next. The new Dodge. Get your game face on, man! Go! Ferguson goes down. It's a terrific leaping catch. The shake it down! memorable year in sports, we look back at the ones who came out on top, the teams who won it all, and the greats of the game who once again shine. Those who burst onto the scene to grab the spotlight, and of course the one who left at the top of his game. So join us as Sports Illustrated presents the year in sports 1993, beginning with the NFL playoffs in January. I'll tell you what, man, just like any heavyweight fight, someone's got to throw the first punch. And I'll tell you what, let's not wait around, let's deliver, not accept. Let's go. Hit, 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 hit. Bring it, bring it, bring it. Rush the quarterback. He sucked the game! You understand? Rush the quarterback. They pressure him and they 
Look at it. Oh, The road to 1993 Super Bowl was as fast and furious as ever. Let's go on and let's show them how it's done. Oh, baby, what a play! Put that sucker in your VCR! That guy over it is. Oh, touchdown! They're pumped up, man. We're pumped up, too. Oh, this is incredible. This is one of the very best. Puts inside the 20, brings another tackle. Down the side line, to the 30, streaking to the sideline. In the AFC, winning came hard for the Buffalo Bills. The two-time defending conference champs took more hits than in recent years and had to begin the playoffs with backup quarterback Frank Reich. Fasten your seatbelts, it's playoff time. The Bills and the Oilers ready to get it on in an AFC wild card game. One, two, three, big hit! Uh, uh, with the Oilers completely in sync, the Bills almost didn't get past the first round as Warren Moon led Houston to a staggering 32-point lead. Touchdown! They were just perfect. Warren Moon was as good as he's ever been in any half of football in his career. Near sideline, Jeffries at the five, he's in, touchdown! Well, you know, the lights are on here at Rich Stadium. They've been on since this morning. You could pretty much turn them out on the uh, Bills right now. We're sitting there, God, what happened? We're getting blown out by these guys. And we were just like, what are you going to do next week? <laughs> Where are you guys going? You guys going golfing? Some guy comes over to me and he says, hey, you mind if I use your phone? I'm so-and-so from a Houston TV station. I said, yeah, fine, go ahead. So he picks up the phone and he calls his travel agent. And he makes a non-refundable airplane reservation for the following weekend to go to Pittsburgh. And I even said to him, I said, good move. And to be quite honest, at that point, when we were down by 32, we're, uh, in my mind, it was just kind of trying to make it respectable. Eventually, the Bills would make it more than respectable, mounting the greatest comeback in the history of the NFL. You could almost sense something in the air at the stadium. I mean, it was strange. Four-man rush, drops back in the pocket, sails it long, oh, oh, BB at the 10, at the 5, in for the touchdown! Looking to throw, rolls out, throws, down there is a Reed at the 5, in for the touchdown! And now the Bills trail by 11 points, 35-24. Bang, bang, bang. He looks, he throws, three, touchdown! Then boom, 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 right after another. Back to throw, he looks, he throws, touchdown! And then we were like, man, this is unbelievable. Pandemonium all over! Bills can win it here. Wright puts it down, the kick is on the way, and it is good! And the Bills have won it! The Bills have won it! They win it 41-38! What a comeback! You're playing games to find out who are the contenders and who are the pretenders. I like for our teams to have a little swagger about them. I like for them to be somewhat cocky and confident. Oh, what a play! That is a mark of a champion. With Troy Aikman leading the offensive charge, the class of the NFC was clearly the Dallas Cowboys. Touchdown! We'd like to think of ourselves as an aggressive offense. And a this man wide open. An attacking offense. Catch it. Oh, he's still going. Oh, no, no, no. He's going to score. He's got the five. It's a touchdown. Oh, Number one with the Cowboys, everybody talks about Aikman and Emmett and Michael Irvin. But you always come back to defense, an absolutely tremendous, suffocating defense. It is not, it is not. Throughout their championship charge, the Cowboys rode their ferocious defense, which was ranked number one in the league. We have a nasty attitude in this defense. We're stripping the ball. We're tackling you hard. We're gonna take your head off. Our Cowboy defense, unconscious! In the NFC Championship, it was Steve Young who was nearly knocked unconscious as Dallas upset the 49ers to go to the Super Bowl. How about them, Cowboys? Yeah! Good afternoon, everybody.
Good everybody, and welcome to the greatest show in sport. From the Rose Bowl in Pasadena, California, it's the Bills and the Cowboys in Super Bowl 27. Nice day to be world champions today, wouldn't you think? How about them Cowboys, huh? <laughs> the night before the Super Bowl, Jimmy went into his team meeting with his players, and he said, Let's just make sure we're focused, and they'll turn the ball over. Throw it in the end zone, intercepted! They'll turn the ball over. Got a fumble on the play! And they'll turn the ball over. Throws the ball out, intercepted by Everett at the 30. And it happens. I mean, you boom, he start turning the ball over, and everybody's looking around like, oh, he's a voodoo man or something, you know, what's going on? Jim Kelly was totally unable to cope with two things. One, the different looks he was seeing defensively. Kelly's gonna throw, here's Haley, hit him, and picked off in the air. Jimmy Jones intercepts and rolls in for a touchdown. And two, the different kinds of rushes he was seeing. Coming after him. And here's the quick pass, and they are in on Kelly. Uh-oh, he's holding and his knee. And he is hurt. I think it was just, uh, it was a gimme game for, for Dallas at that point. Aikman to Urban. Dallas touchdown. Throws it right to the goal line. Urban jumping, catching the three. Diving, touchdown. For 60 minutes, the Cowboys were relentless. In the end, a 52-17 route of the Bills. We've come an awful long way from 1 and 15, 3 and 13, from being kicked around. Now we were number one. We were doing the kicking around. We were the very best in football. It was a feeling of satisfaction. And we finally reached the pinnacle of our profession. And words can't describe it. It was unbelievable. What a ride it's been. Troy Aikman's the MVP. And Dallas, your Cowboys are the champions. Great catch for a touchdown! He is gone! Touchdown! Can you believe it? When the smoke cleared on the college football season, the battle for number one took place in the Sugar Bowl on January 1st. A lot of people didn't respect us going into that game. Alabama was a team that everybody knew was going to come in second place in this game. Got a touchdown, Miami! They gave us no chance. Miami's going to win the Sugar Bowl, and uh, I'm not even sure exactly who they're playing. It'll probably be about 48 to nothing. We knew if we played and played well, we could beat Miami. This is Alabama's opportunity to gain respect. They had to go right up the gut, and they did it right from the start. I think he goes right up the middle. Run at Miami. What a Lassick. Power football from the left side. Big play here for Lassick. Nothing fancy. And up the middle goes Lynch. Inside the five. We dominated in physical. Classic. While the tide rolled on offense, its defense stopped Miami cold. That defense just swarmed and attacked. Especially humbled was Gino Toretta, Miami's Heisman Trophy winning quarterback. Toretto hardly knew what it was like to lose, but suddenly, in the biggest game of his career, the guy's seeing something he's never seen before. For Alabama, a thoroughly convincing 34-13 win, a national championship for the Crimson Tide. Runs him down, takes the ball, takes the ball away from him. He's got the ball. They dominated Miami the way I have not seen a Miami team dominated in years, and I think it was all the more of a domination because it was completely unexpected. They talked to talk, but they just couldn't walk the walk. When the college basketball season tipped off, the race for number one was wide open. Watch out! He's going to get the 
At one time or another during the year, six schools were ranked number one. And in April, four of those met to decide the national championship. It was a gathering of college basketball's elite when North Carolina beat Kansas in one semifinal. While Michigan powered past Kentucky to set up a clash of two heavyweights for the national championship. Two teams, two distinct styles, but only one could claim the crown. There probably can't be a bigger contrast in college basketball than the one between Michigan and North Carolina. North Carolina is patterned, system, everything planned. Michigan was improvisation, kind of like a pickup game on a playground. For people who like to see differing styles of play, this was, this was your ultimate game. They seem to get themselves going off dunks. It, it, it seems to be almost like a light switch that, uh, that gets their, their energy pumped up. Oh yeah, definitely. It gets our crowd going. It gets the whole game back to excited and, and gets everybody pumped. He'll go in all alone, slams it While Michigan stayed inside, the Tar Heels countered with the dead-eye shooting of Donald Williams. A lot of pushing going on down in low. Williams, wow. Now Donald Williams to the baseline, shooting on the move and scoring. My teammates recognize that and they do a good job of screening for me and really giving me the ball when they see I have the hot hand. He was able to come down and drain one shot I thought was about from half court. Mr. Williams on the right side. Donald spots up for a three, got it. Coach Smith kind of gave it a like, <laughs> that kind of look. Like two titans, the teams battled evenly down the stretch, trading baskets and dreams with the national title on the line, eventually setting the stage for one of the most dramatic moments in tournament history. 73-71. Sullivan shooting to give Carolina a three-point lead. 20 seconds remain. Sullivan's free throw is no good. Rebounded by Weber. Michigan out of timeout. Weber, front court, Carolina thought he'd travel with it. Weber, front court, Carolina was foul. He takes the timeout, they're out of timeout. Take that go foul. Take that go foul. I dribbled down the court looking for someone, and then my automatic reaction is to call a timeout and set something up. So I did that, and obviously we didn't have any timeouts left. And at that point, it was just, that was probably the lowest point of my life right there. A huge mental mistake. Nothing you could have said could have affected me. At that time, all I was thinking was, you know, God, why would you let this happen to me? A few seconds later, the national championship belonged to the Tar Heels. No good. Front of the rim. Lynch with a rebound. Out at the belt. It's over. Carolina. The Tar Heels have won the national championship. Right where they won it 11 years ago. North Carolina's victory was well earned. But if there's one play from the tournament that will live on, it's Weber's ill-timed timeout. All I was practicing for was 20 seconds of life, and I wouldn't have practiced as hard as I would. I wouldn't play basketball. You know, I'm more than 20 seconds of a person and more than 20 seconds of a man. I made a mistake. It hurts, but it didn't make me any less of a player. It didn't make Michigan any less of a team. We lost the game. I was unfortunate. But we all made mistakes. I just made mine in front of, you know, 20 million people. <laughs> In 1993, some of the year's more memorable moments were also some of the funniest.
Is that on? And now an up-close look at some very close calls. We begin with John Crook's brush with death at the All-Star Game. Although the Phillies' first baseman didn't exactly have an all-star at bat, at least he lived to see another day. He knew that was coming. John had no chance. Incredibly, Rusty Wallace lived to race another day after this crash, although a few weeks later, he did give fans an encore performance. Meanwhile, the Reds' Jose Rio gave it to the crowd at Chicago's Wrigley Field, while teammate Tom Browning decided to give in and join the crowd across the street during a game. During a promotion in Houston, fans did their best Charles Barkley impersonation. But alas, there's only one Charles. But the difference is they won't look as good as I do being bald. Because I look good bald and they're going to be ugly with hair or bald. Speaking of ugly, a fan at Madison Square Garden scored an apparent goal for the New York Rangers by throwing a puck into the net from the stands. Got to put him in a loony tune bit. Wow. Not to be outdone, a New York Yankee fan assisted on a Don Mattingly game-winning home run by taking the ball away from Orioles right fielder Mark McLemore. Mattingly, unbelievably! But even he was topped by this Yankee fan who ran onto the field and canceled what would have been the game's last out. With new life, the Yanks staged a dramatic two-out, three-run rally for a very weird win. In Philly, this rendition of Take Me Out to the Ball Game turned into Take My Baton at the Ball Game. While finally in Chicago, Bulls fan Don Calhoun won one million dollars with this one in a million shot. So who needs Michael Jordan? I'm a bad, bad man. 1993 saw its share of memorable bouts and menacing boxers. And among the best were three of the most powerful punchers in the sport. Tonight is lights out for you, baby. Two more uppercuts in there. Roy Jones Jr. Great left hand was spectacular. De La Hoya attacks again. It should be stopped. It was a year of power and guts, and in the end, only the strong survived. The two best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world finally met in September, when Pernell Whitaker made the most of his long-awaited battle with Julio Cesar Chavez. He won it hands down, it really. He keeps backing Chavez up, which no one's ever done. To the body and coming back with combinations to the head. Whitaker follows with the left. He's a great fight, you know, just an extraordinarily bad decision. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a draw. Among the big boys, WBC heavyweight champion Lennox Lewis defended his title in October with a courageous knockout of fellow Englishman Frank Bruno. See if he can finish. Bruno in serious trouble. The most popular fighter. Meanwhile, George Foreman pounded Pierre Coetzer in typical Foreman fashion. But then Big George lost to Tommy Morrison in what may have been his final bout. Last round, there ain't no more. And Morrison comes back with a left hook. And new champion, Tommy! Morrison defended his WBO title by knocking out Carl the Truth Williams. But soon after, Tommy looked like a liar when Michael Bent dropped him with a shocking first round knockout. On the birds of a big moment, and he's got it. That's it. A first round KO for Michael Bent. None of those heavyweight bouts, however, lived up to the shootout in Las Vegas. Swing and swing after the bell. Like they had the previous November, Riddick Bowe and Evander Holyfield again turned in the fight of the year. It would shock the world. Stuns Bowe again. And the round comes to a close. The bell saving Riddick Bowe from further punish. The night also provided the spectacle of the year. Incredibly, a parachutist crashed into the ring in the middle of the seventh round, 
and disrupted the fight for more than 20 minutes. Startled but unharmed, the two fighters regrouped and resumed their hostilities. Close the mouthpiece out with a left hook. This is it. Holy, 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 holy. In a 12-round decision, Evander Holyfield regained the crown he lost to Bo a year ago. And once again, heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Nineteen ninety three is the year the NBA welcomed the Shaq. If there was one thing I learned and learned quickly, these guys are serious. In the NBA playoffs, Michael Jordan and the Bulls breeze past the Atlanta Hawks and then finished off the Cleveland Cavaliers in typical Jordan style. Oh, the Bulls' much-anticipated battle against the New York Knicks was next, but what was unexpected was the play of John Starks. Starks, for the Starks was hitting him coming off picks, pulling up on fast breaks with somebody in his face all alone. There was just nobody that could stop him. Starks. The Garden at that point just erupted, and if anyone would have taken any bets to any team beside the New York Knicks, who were going to be the Eastern Conference champions, would have been silly. Down two games to none, Chicago won at home, setting up a crucial game four. Yet even in the series, they needed a game where Jordan was going to go out and win it himself, and that's just about what he did. Jordan hung dangling, hang, pop, Jordan was unstoppable. His 54 points helped send Chicago back to New York tied at two, where in game five, the Knicks trailed by a point as time ran down. Two, Chicago closed out the Knicks and moved one step away from its third straight title. Meanwhile, out west, league MVP Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns finished the regular season with the NBA's best record. But in round one against the lowly Lakers, the Suns found themselves a game away from elimination. We're down 0-2, and I know the next question is, are you guys dead? No, we're going to win the series. We're going to win one Tuesday, and the next game's Thursday, we'll win there. Then we'll come back and we'll win the series on Sunday. The Suns proved Paul Westfall a profit, winning their third straight game to take the series. I don't want to take credit for it. They played. I mean, all I did was pop off. I'm just glad they made me look good. Phoenix continued to look good, knocking off San Antonio and then Seattle to set up the title bout between the game's two biggest stars, Charles Barkley and Michael Jordan. I don't really think it mattered to us who we were playing, but I think for the fans and for the media, it was a great matchup. But I think if you want to be successful, you don't compete against uh, the other team, whether they're the champions, whether they got great players. I think if you want to be successful, you got to just compete against yourself. And uh, we were just happy to get there. Happy to get there, but unhappy at what happened at home. Charles backs into the lane. Rejected by Scott Williams. Two Suns losses in Phoenix gave the Bulls a decided advantage and set up a memorable game three when the series moved to Chicago. Two sluggers up in a 
in a home run contest that's just going to go on and on. Who can make more big plays? Who can make more uh, dramatic efforts? Every shot was uh, crucial, and uh, that's what you live for when you play basketball. Just a game where uh, neither team wanted to go, go down. It was an emotional up and down roller coaster. Every play was significant. Got his own rebound back and lays it in. Like two heavyweights, the teams battled toe to toe for four quarters and three overtime periods. Neither able to knock the other out until Dan Marley started throwing haymakers. Sixth three pointer. Just kind of playing above the floor. You just kind of um, you're not really thinking about whole lot. You're kind of in an unconscious state. You're just out there having fun. Down the stretch, Barkley iced the victory, tightening the series at two games to one. Unfazed, Jordan responded like a champion. Game four was Michael Jordan saying, I'm not going to lose this game. He simply took the game on his shoulders and he said, you know, they're going to overplay me at the wing. I'm just going to take it to the basket. Jordan quickly by him. Attack the basket time and time again. Jordan will drive again. To he was just hoop. running him over. Now to Jordan quickly by him. And Phoenix tried to stop him, but he just had it in him that he was not going to be stopped. In the end, it was a 55-point ambush and a 3-1 Bulls lead. After staying alive in Game 5, the Suns put on the heat in Game 6. But just when it looked like Phoenix would force a Game 7, the Bulls overcame a two-point deficit with just four seconds to play. I was just kind of hanging around the three-point line. Uh, I got a, a clean look at the, the basket and had my rhythm and, and just let it go. And certainly tops the list of shots I've ever made. Moments later, the Bulls were champions again. A few months after the season, however, Chicago's joy turned to sorrow when Michael Jordan shocked the sports world by announcing his retirement, ending perhaps the greatest career in NBA history. Coming into the city of Chicago, it wasn't a bright situation. We were not on top. We were not even in the middle. All they had to say was wait until next year. And it gives me great gratification that during the time that I played a game of basketball here in the city of Chicago, they don't have to say that anymore. You know, they got bragging rights all over the country. Now it can be known as a championship team. It's not because I don't love the game. I love the game of basketball, I always will. I just feel that I don't have anything else for myself to prove. When I get to a pinnacle and I'm, I feel that my skills are still good, I'm not starting on the downside of my career, I want to walk away from the game. And it's been very fortunate that I'm on top. And I'm coming off three championship seasons. This is the perfect timing for me to walk away. It was an honor to play with a guy that was that talented and meant so much to a city, to an organization, to the game of basketball itself. I, I just am so honored to have played alongside him. No one could believe what Michael Jordan could do on the court. I couldn't even believe it half the time, but after I've seen it for so many times, it was like, I guess he's, he's real. I had to touch him a few times to make sure. I know the kids are going to be disappointed, but hopefully they learn that basketball is great to play. It's an enjoyment, it's a fun, it's a hobby. But it's a lot to life other than sports. Life in the NHL is fast, furious, and not for the faint of heart.
In the regular season, the hockey world was stunned by the news of Mario Lemieux's battle with Hodgkin's disease. But after missing 24 games, it was Lemieux's performance that was stunning, as the game's greatest player quickly returned to form. Just have to focus on them all. Here comes Lemieux! He scores! Once again, Lemieux led the league in scoring and had the Penguins gunning for a third straight Stanley Cup until they ran into the upset-minded New York Islanders. Overtime. 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 There's no margin of errors in overtime. It's do or die. This team loved to play under pressure. There's some kind of fate going on. Or... We felt overtime was our time. Overtime was prime time for the Montreal Canadiens who won 10 straight playoff games in OT, including three against Wayne Gretzky and the LA Kings in the Stanley Cup Finals. After soundly losing Game 1, Montreal again found themselves trailing Kelly Rudy and the Kings in Game 2, until Jock Demers decided to gamble. And we knew that Marty McSorley had an illegal stick. We got something critical going on here. It's a stick measurement. You're allowed a half inch curve. That is the device that measures the curve. So Jock took a chance. If he is guilty of playing with an illegal stick, the LA Kings will be penalized and Marty McSorley will have to sit for two minutes. Come on, come on, come on. It's illegal. Yes! Marty was playing with an illegal stick, we called it, and uh, next thing you know. Desjardins shot. Stop! scored on uh, the power play and then scored in overtime again. The old overtime was back in our favor again. Two more overtime wins in games three and four allowed Montreal to win the cup in the four up. The 24 Stanley Cup batter will hang from the rafters of the famous four up. In Montreal, the Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Now it's time for our 1993 Dubious Achievement Awards. For those athletes who prove that it's not whether you win or lose, but how poorly you played the game. We begin with Jose Canseco. In 1993, the Rangers' controversial outfielder thrilled fans by doing his famous Pele impression. If that wasn't enough, Jose later did his wild thing impression, injuring his arm and missing the rest of the year. Way to use your head, Jose. Our If At First You Don't Succeed award goes to pitcher Anthony Young of the New York Mets, who set a major league record for futility by losing 27 consecutive games. In August, AY's streak mercifully ended, giving the lowly Mets their lone highlight of the season. Rain delay honors go to the Florida Marlins grounds crew, who made covering the baseball field look about as easy as nuclear physics. Later, it was reported that Florida traded two groundskeepers for an umbrella to be named later. An award for the terrible timeout goes to the Miami Hurricanes, who stayed in their huddle just a bit too long. They give it in. Miami did not get back on the floor in time. Tie game right here, and the clock is running. Sure doesn't look like they spent too much time in that huddle setting up the offense. Shot. Edwards strips McCullough. He's got time. Gets it ahead. And point. Oh, Jones wow. plays it in. Oh, unbelievable. I have never seen that happen. Our final award goes to the Dallas Cowboys Super Bowl show-off, Leon Lett. And fumble. And Leon Lett. Hey, Leon, if there is a next time, don't even think about letting up.
Baseball 1993 was filled with some incredible individual moments. The season's end saw the career end for three of the game's biggest stars, all of whom would likely gather again in Cooperstown. Meanwhile, Barry Bonds had a year that belongs in Cooperstown. His quick start led San Francisco to a 10-game lead over Atlanta. But in July, the Braves caught fire with the acquisition of Fred McGriff, whose presence helped ignite Atlanta's bats as the Braves eventually overtook the Giants and won the division on the last day of the season. Joining Atlanta in the playoffs were the Philadelphia Phillies, the Chicago White Sox, and baseball's defending champions, the Toronto Blue Jays. Hit in the air, deep to right field, at the wall, home run, Lenny Dykstra on the run to the warning track, leaps and makes the catch, at the wall, great leaping catch, Guzman wins another battle, Kim Batiste goes from goat to hero in a matter of minutes, and the Blue Jays are going back to the World Series, he struck him out! The 1993 Fall Classic got off to a classic start, with the team splitting the first two games. Lob down the right field, Mark a great catch by Alomar. Dykstra on the move, at the warning track. Alomar, shallow right center, one high, and he makes a terrific leaping catch. Game one saw reliever Al Leiter shut down the fills, while teammates Devon White and John Oru delivered the decisive blows in an 8-5 victory. The next night, Jim Eisenreich's three-run homer kept a five-run third inning for the fills, as they escaped Skydome with the series tied at one game each. Back in Philly, the Blue Jays adjusted to life without the designated hitter. That meant batting champ John Olrood was out, and Paul Molitor was in, and contributing, starting with his first at bat. Right center and in for a hit, and on the wet turf, it scoops past Eisenreich to the wall. Henderson is in, and Molitor has a triple. I was able to concentrate better than I have in a long time in terms of every at bat, having an idea of what I wanted to get done. And thankfully, because of uh, our lineup, had a lot of opportunities to get significant hits. On this night, another of Molitor's significant hits helped the Jays to a 10-3 route and a two games to one lead in the series. Game four saw runs rain down all night long in the biggest slugfest in World Series history. It was just a great game. It was like watching the greatest heavyweight fight of all time. I mean, guys pounding at one another, you know, round after round. We got off to a great start, three runs. Well hit, base hit, White is in. They come back with four. In the air to center, racing back, at the wall, can't get it. Two great teams going at it, not one of them giving up. Stalker's relay, out of third. Has the momentum swung from one team to the other. Well hit down the right field line toward the pole, it is a home run. Stottlemyre can't 
can't do anything to stop the bleeding. It was just one of those things where if the thunder doesn't get you, then the lightning will. That's why they did it. Base hit. Butler will have a chance to score the go-ahead run. And we were challenged, they were challenged, they came out hitting the ball, smoking. We came out hitting the ball, and the best men win. And he hits one deep to right, forget about it. Way out of here. Lakestra, his second home run. Eventually, the Phils pulled ahead by five. They looked like they had it in the bag. In fact, the Blue Jays made some moves on the field that conceded the game to the Phillies, literally. But then you never know with those Blue Jay bats. They just, you know, they just came back. One hitter after another. Down 14-9 in the eighth inning, Toronto pounded the Phillies pitchers and pulled to within one run with two outs and two on. Little looper, long run for Dykstra in right center, can't get it. Borders around with the tying run. Henderson to the plate with the go-ahead run. The great ball clubs always win those one-run ball games. And you look at game four, it was a one-run ball game. <laughs> Kurt Schilling kept the Phils alive in game five, pitching a shutout to send the series back to Toronto with the Jays up 3-2. But Sky Dome looked like Sky Doom for the Phils, as MVP Paul Molitor and the Jays coasted to a 5-1 lead through six innings. Suddenly, however, Lenny Dykstra brought the Phils back to life with a three-run blast. Five batters later, Philadelphia led 6-5, a lead they protected into the ninth. That's when things really got wild. We knew something wild was going to happen. You know, he didn't get his nickname by going out there and going 1-2-3. The very first pitch, and he's ready to throw the ball home. The umpire calls a timeout. He doesn't see it. The umpire's going this way. Ricky's going that way, and Dalton's running the other way, and he's going to throw the ball home. And right then we said, hey, look out. He says, something's going to happen. He walked Ricky on four pitches. Williams walks Henderson on four pitches to open the nine. Line to center, falling fast to him. Third of the night for Molitor. Henderson stops in second. Well, the tying run is at second. And the run that would win the World Series is at first, and Joe Carter is the batter. Bob in the ninth, game six of the World Series, and uh, this is something that, as a little kid, I remember at my father's service station, I was like eight, nine years old, uh, dreaming of things like that. The sports world is not immune from tragedy, but rarely, if ever, has a single year been so cruel to our emotions. Through the darkness and gloom, we endure. Through the grief, we go on, comforted with our memories, and secure in the knowledge that a new day always dawns, bringing with it new champions, like the ones who captivated us in 1993.